I feel like it's very appropriate to be beginning Comic-Con with something tied to uh, some of the most iconic figures in comics. And so welcome to the uh, DC Icons panel. And uh, I'm Mary Elizabeth Itteraldi with Mysterious Galaxy here in San Diego. And I'm gonna introduce my panelists, thank you. And, uh, and then I'm gonna ask them some questions and then we're going to have the part where you all get to ask them your questions and people who ask questions while they last will get to have nifty nifty t-shirts provided by Random House Children's Books. You're being bribed is what we're trying to say. <laughs> They're super soft. They are way. really soft. Yeah, we may actually critique your questions, so, you know, think on them a little. All right, so, uh, beginning with our first Superman novelist and author, Matt De La Pena. So Matt is a New York Times bestselling and Newbery winning author and also of interest to locals. He is a nominee for the San Diego Red Balloon Award, which is an award for people who do works in our community to help bring literacy to uh, underserved kids. So welcome, Matt. He has penned six critically acclaimed young adult novels, including Mexican White Boy and The Living, for which he received an award. Um, and he has a bunch of other wonderful awards, including the fact that his picture book, Last Stop on Market Street, was awarded the Newbery Medal, with, Ill mm, with the illustrator's work being awarded a Caldecott honor. Uh, he received his MFA in creative writing from San Diego State University, um, but he's on the East Coast now and we miss him, so. Good morning. And next to him, we have Wonder Woman, Lee Bardugo. <laughs> Lee is the number one New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of the Grisha Trilogy and her young adult fantasy duology, Six of Crows, and shoot, I just lost the second one. Starts Crooked with Kingdom. C. Crooked Kingdom. Crooked, Crooked Kingdom. kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> like when four of you say it at once, I get every other syllable. Um, uh, was a wonderful combination of crime and fantasy. I do like crime, and I do like fantasy. <laughs> Her Grisha books have been sold in 30 territories, and the first trilogy is in development with DreamWorks for a book-to-film adaptation. She was born in Jerusalem, grew up in Los Angeles, and graduated from Yale University, and she lives and writes in Hollywood, California, where she no longer does fancy makeup for other people, but she is always impeccably presented. So welcome, Wow, Lee. no pressure. <laughs> And rounding out the big three, we have our Batman author, Marie Lu. <laughs> Marie is the number one New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of the Legend Trilogy. And the Young Elites Fantasy Trilogy reached number one on the New York Times bestseller list. And Fox and Temple Hill have bought the film rights. And if you're downstairs in the exhibit hall in the Penguin Random House booth, you will see the big, shiny, very colorful thing for Warcross. It's you. like this big, cool, light up exhibit. And uh, she is one of our other Southern California authors, and we are delighted to have her here. And um, one of my questions is going to be Is there a lot of Nightwing? And I'm guessing not because oh, of the I age wish. of Batman, because that would be like, and infant Nightwing. That, that would have been the first thing that I would have wanted to add, but he would have been a baby. <laughs> so, and welcome Marie. When, that, when Bruce was 18, so. That's a very, um, like, sitcom -y version of Batman, <laughs> where he's, like, a teenager with a little baby <laughs> Nightwing to take care of. You're gonna grow oh, up to brood just, just like Daddy. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, that seems like a good leaping off point for what connects you with these characters, what brought you to do these works, and, um, how does it feel to write about them at that stage in their lives, which is when they are teens? So Matt, lucky you, you oh, sat right, next to me, so <laughs> um, welcome to your first Comic-Con panel. Yes, 
Yeah, by the way, this is the first time I've ever been at Comic-Con. This is crazy town here. <laughs> so many people outside. Um, yeah, so I got to do Superman, and this was, it was, um, when, I, when I first was presented the idea, it was kind of overwhelming because you feel like, wow, you have that imposter syndrome. You know, how can I add to this iconic character? Um, but then you start to think about what you do in, in your other work and how you can apply it to the superhero. And for me, you know, one of the most interesting things happening right now is the uh, conversation centering around immigration. And I was like, wow, you know, Superman, the ultimate immigrant. So that kind of informed what I could do with the character. And then, of course, we're writing YA novels, and we've been doing this for a while, you know. So we bring the things that we've been doing in our other work to the superhero um, coming of age, still, uh, part of their their character. So it's it's been a really uh, kind of a crazy, overwhelming um, experience for me. Yeah, I mean, the way I found out about it was um, my agent got this very vague email from Random House that was like, "We're doing a thing with some DC characters. Would Lee be interested?" And I was like, "If it's Wonder Woman, yes. <laughs> if anybody else, no." Um, and I think that's because. Um, I, I mean, I, like a lot of kids, grew up on Wonder Woman, um, really more like, less the comics than Super Friends and, um, you know, Linda Carter and, you know, making construction paper bracelets and twirling around in my driveway. And, uh, and I think, you know, and I, I actually did read a lot of comics and it wasn't until really I, like, like I hit puberty that I stopped being interested in the comics that I had been reading and moved away from superheroes and over to things like Dark Horse and um, Vertigo. And I think it's because, um, I got boobs and was like, gravity doesn't work that way. And I was just like, I don't understand that bustier. Like, I have enough trouble going to, like, like going to the beach without putting a t-shirt on. So um, I think for me, my experience with Wonder Woman was loving her, falling out of love with her, and then falling back in love with her as an adult and beginning to understand really what she represents and, um, and falling in love with the different, new different kinds of representations and coming back to her through um, Rucka and not his most recent run, but through, I always, I never pronounce this word, Hecataya, Hecataya? Anyway, um, yeah, so I don't know, she means a lot to me. She means a lot to a lot of people, and I think it's because she's not just strong, she's kind, and we live in a world that could use a little more compassion to, with all that strength, so it was a real pleasure to write her. And, and I just recently finished reading Warbringer, and it is just fantastic. Um, it has all of the things that you would love in a Lee Bardugo book. So, Ooh. yeah. Like what? Very well. No. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. Well, <laughs> one, um, I, yeah, I, I think Batman was the very first superhero I ever really knew anything about. Um, my first exposure to him was in Batman the Animated Series, which I, like, watched into the ground as a kid. Um, and he wasn't just like the first superhero I knew, he was like the first nuanced character I kind of was introduced to, this character who's always kind of being tempted the dark side, you could totally see that happening. Um, and, and I've always been drawn to that, that gray area in characters. Um, and like Matt was saying, you know, we try to bring our, um, what we have in our own work to these characters. Um, and, and I thought that would be a really interesting and fun challenge to, to do with Batman. Um, I remember when my agent first emailed me about this project. I don't think I didn't even read the attachment that came with it <laughs> because that actually had the actual superheroes that you could choose from. And I'm like, yes, what are, what are we doing? <laughs> She's like, read the attachment. <laughs> um, so it's been uh, a privilege and an honor to be able to explore um, this area of Bruce's life that is kind of a black hole. Like we don't really know anything about Bruce as a teenager. So um, it's been really interesting to explore. So. You spoke a little bit of some of your personal experiences with um, encountering the characters that you're working on um, in your youth, but are there other characters that are meaningful to you? Are there other characters who, you know, you made maybe a cardboard tiara for, or? <laughs> I mean, I mean. I was thinking of Luke Cage. Not to cross the streams, but um, like, I was really into the X-Men, you know, Storm. I was, I was coming of age when Storm had a mohawk, so I was obsessed with her, um, <laughs> with good reason, um, and Wolverine, and uh, I was also like really into Black Canary as a kid, because she had the, like, the most amazing outfit. Like, I don't know why you fight crime in fishnets and heels, but do it, girl. <laughs> um, 
I mean, yeah, I don't, the, I think Wonder Woman was the character that I fell in love with first and who stayed in my consciousness in a way that a lot of characters didn't, you know? But there were also characters like, like outside of the superhero universe that were like Buffy and even Jem and like, like characters that were sort of um, broke the mold in terms of what was expected from them as heroes. Yeah, for me, it's, uh, I have a really good friend who is a Batman aficionado. So he will be watching closely. Oh my God. <laughs> But I was, wow, he, he got me really into <laughs> he got me really into Batman and um, Batman's interesting because there's a darkness and then of course Superman you have kind of a totally different character and it's funny when I write YA uh, you know I like the darkness the darkness is fascinating to me so in a weird way it was it was kind of like refreshing to write Superman who I think you have to own who he is yeah. you know you can't try to pitch, you kind of can't like try to stick him somewhere else where, cause that's where. Don't Batman him up. Yeah, exactly, yeah, that's exactly. a good way to put it. So I think one of, the, one of the cool things was just embracing who he is historically, but also divorcing yourself from what's been done because you have, the only thing you can really do is write your version of that, of that character. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because um, the series I had just come off, come off of was um, Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom, which is, um, it's a heist story. It's a fantasy heist with that is populated by, I'm not even sure you could call them morally gray, like they're just jerks. Um, so, you know, so delightful. they are delightful, I, I, thank you. But like, there are thugs and they're thieves and they're murderers and um, they are largely, at least initially, out for themselves and, um, writing Wonder Woman was very different after that. And even my mood was different. Like I would come off of writing something from Crooked Kingdom and be like, life, <laughs> humanity. But I'd come off of writing a Wonder Woman sequence and I would be like, we're gonna be okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the original question? No, don't know. Other superheroes or comic characters? Other superheroes. That um, I, I love the Teen Titans. I think they're so fun. Um, I. They have two of my favorite uh, lady superheroes, um, Starfire and Raven, who just pair so well together. Because Starfire is just so gleeful. Everything is amazing. And what is this new world? And Raven's just like, I, don't talk to me. Um, <laughs> and I feel like it's I us. That dynamic. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what friends. <laughs> um, yeah, so I love them. And I have a really soft spot for Robin. Um, he, um, it, you know, he, he is walking in the footsteps of Batman, but comes from such a different background. Um, he, he doesn't come from a lot of money, and he looks up to this guy. Um, and their whole dynamic is just really heartwarming. It's like the happy family of the Bat-ish universe. <laughs> yeah, I enjoy them a lot. So sort of tying into Matt's comment on uh, staying true to iterations of the character and maybe not other ones, and uh, tying into the Batman and Robin relationship, which changes depending on whether you're talking about, you know, um, uh, which Robin, uh, you know. Um, what uh, were your freedoms and limitations in choosing what iteration of these superheroes you could write? For example, Wonder Woman's birth sequence is very di different depending on the different mythologies. Uh, yeah, not just her birth sequence, but um, for me, one of the things that drew me to the story was the chance to um, put my own stamp on Amazon mythology. Um, there are different versions of it, and uh, in my version of it, um, the way you get to Themyscira is, or Themyscira, I never know, um, is that if any woman who dies bravely in battle, if she cries out to a female deity in her last moments, she can have the choice to become an Amazon and to dedicate her life instead of to war to peace. And that was important to me because one, it means you don't have this kind of um, warrior super race living outside of time. And two, it means that you're not completely divorced from modernity. Like you've made the choice not to engage with the world of man, but uh, you also know things like, you know, like, so that when Diana comes to our world, spoiler, she comes to our world, um, <laughs> that she's not just like, you, you, there's certain things you can skip over in terms of like, automobile. Um, <laughs> so 
that gave me a little bit more leeway to play. And look, I'll be honest, there are times, like, this for me was a very different writing experience. Authors usually, like, within, like, pretty loose boundaries, we're allowed to do what we want. You know, we are, I always feel sorry for screenwriters because they have so many cooks in the kitchen, and this was sort of the closest I've gotten to that. So it's not that there aren't moments of compromise, there are, um, but in the end it's kind of worth it because you get to be a part of this iconic character's history. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, there was something, I mean, I was heavily influenced by certain things from everyone from Perez to Simone to Rucka to, you know, but I took what I, what resonated with me and I kind of left behind what didn't. Yeah, I think uh, it's interesting, this idea that there are many cooks in the kitchen. And yeah, when we write our, our standalones or, you know, the series is, that we come up with, you know, there, there's nobody really to answer to. In this case, there was, and I gotta say, in some ways, I liked it. Um, I liked that there were there were lines to to work within. There's a great line um, referring to poetry. Sometimes the rhyme is smarter than the poet, <laughs> and sometimes that kind of forces you into a, an idea that you never would have thought of if you didn't have to nail this rhyme. Well, I think the same thing happened for me in the writing of Superman. It's it's like I, I was working within these lines, and it and it kind of made me think in new story directions, if that makes sense. Um, but it, it's, it can be frustrating in other ways, so. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's different. Yeah, it's, it's different. It's a different, different. Kind of different process. And a lot of the times, the, at least because the, uh, my book has nothing to do with the movie. And just so you all know, there's no Steve. Because I've already started people being like, where's Steve? And yeah. I was like, white hetero heaven. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, like, there were certain things that, that I didn't, they wouldn't even let me see the script, so it was like, you can't go here. And I was like, but why? And they'd be like, I can't tell you. It was actually like a YA novel. It was like, you're on this quest, but we can't give you all the information. That's you just really have funny. to get to Do the thing. Yeah, yeah exactly. Us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there were a lot of those weird little moments, too, with Batman, where like, there's certain ways you can say, like, Gotham City Police Department, which you have to say all together. Like, you cannot actually say Gotham Police. It has to be the Gotham Police. City Police Department. So, like little tiny things like that, it just reminded me that you know I'm playing in this um, world that many, many, many others have contributed to, yeah. and it's very humbling um, to be a part of that because I'm just so used to like, oh, I just make whatever I want up, um, and in this case, I couldn't do that. Um, but, but I do think that I was given a surprising amount of um, freedom, just in that, like, I was allowed to develop the synopsis. Um, kind of on my own and get to play in that and that was fun and to be able to explore this, again, this period of Bruce's life that um, hasn't really been explored before, yeah. you know, like what was it like to grow up as a teenage billionaire orphan, you know? You should have just called me. <laughs> <laughs> like, let me show you what you can do with your money, Bruce. You're gonna be okay. Um, and, and to be, you know, followed around by paparazzi all the time, uh, and to have people spying on your room, you know, from the newspaper, or, you know, navigating high school as, like, a billionaire orphan, I feel like it's a little, he's definitely got his privileges. Um, but there's also a lot of trust issues that I think he would have um, with people. So I feel like with Bruce, you can be, like, double angsty. He's now, now he's not just Batman, um, who's broody, but he's a teenager. He's a teenage <laughs> Brooding all the time. Life is horrible. Yeah. Um, so, so especially for Bruce slash Batman and Clark slash Superman, um, because I'm not sure whether you separated Diana or not for this work, um, was there any difference in the experience of writing there um, during their different uh, presentations? Because they're always the same person, but they're trying to be someone else outwardly. So for me, I, I think one... And, uh, and maybe it was the same for Batman, but I think the novel is really about creating Superman, you know, like going from Clark to creating this other persona where you can kind of exercise a different part of yourself. Um, as a matter of fact, I think the journey is, what do I do with this, this power that I have, these powers that I have, where do I put them? Can I be myself? Can others know that I have these powers? You know, so the, it was kind of the creation of the split. Yeah, and it's two totally different characters too. I, I feel like with a lot of superheroes, you know, you've got two characters in one. You've got you know Clark Kent and Superman, who are different, uh, and Bruce Wayne and Batman are two different characters. And I've realized as I started writing this that I 
felt like I knew Batman, but I actually didn't really understand Bruce Wayne um, as a character. Uh, and so th that was a challenge, exploring a book where, you know, it, Batman is not really a part of the book. Uh, he is Bruce Wayne, but it, the book is about Bruce Wayne mm. um, before he understands the concept of Batman and of being Batman. Um, and what is it like to be a regular person, like Matt said, like coming to terms with these powers, uh, well, in Bruce's case, a crap Power ton of money. money. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> what do you do with this superpower that you have? Um, so, so that was interesting. But I think and teens in general, this is what they do. You know, like this is the part of your age where you're like, re you're inventing your public self and you're figuring out that there are two parts of you, who you are I alone in a room and who you are in front of peers. And I think, so some of the stuff that we're doing with these superhero stories, it just kind of echoes the teen experience in many ways. Yeah, I think writing Diana was, you know, this really is a Diana story because Again, this Wonder Woman does not yet exist. Um, <clears throat> and for me, it was an opportunity to, and also a challenge to sort of think about what her vulnerabilities are. And I really went to the idea of her being the only child to ever been, to have been born on Themyscira and the only Ramazon who's never proven herself. She's literally surrounded by women who have very strong ideas about heroism and about um, what it means to be a hero, and she's never proven herself. And so that for me was the point of access because like Matt said, this is something we all go through, you know? And you, the first thing you talked about was imposter syndrome, and I think that's with, with us from a very early age. You know, you feel that you have so much potential if somebody would just give you the chance, um, but then you have to be the one to seize it. Yeah, and then they give you the chance, and you're like, oops. <laughs> they like, now I have to messed up. Yeah. Well then, yeah. <laughs> all right, so other than the ability to fight villains in fishnets and high heels, if you, yourself, could have a superpower, what would you like it to be? You guys know that, like, the age-old quandary of flight or invisibility, right? Like, basically, <laughs> if you choose flight, you're a hero, and if you choose invisibility, you're a villain. So I choose invisibility. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Or to be able to write a draft in my sleep. <laughs> That's a good one. If I could write in my sleep. That's that a good one. I would take that over invisibility. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to have to go with a really dorky one. Um, I would love the ability to stop time just so I could get more stuff done or get more sleep and then just click it back on again. That would be awesome. This is the weird thing about being a writer or just a creative person or having a creative job. It's like your significant other is like, God, I wish it was Friday already. And you're like... Jesus, I just wanted to stay Monday as long as possible. What is a weekend? I know, yeah. Weekend. You just like want more time. That's a good point. I think, I think flight is pretty badass. And I think um, watching Superman in my book sort of navigate that and try to figure out how to do that and aspire to that has made me want to fly. I don't trust myself to fly. Like, I'd fall off of bicycles. Like, I feel like I would have a very short shelf. I would need like a skin protector helmet or something yes. because a pod. I have very sensitive skin. Yeah. <laughs> like somebody, I saw a video though of somebody just put like one of those GoPros on an eagle and it was amazing like all the stuff it was doing and how it was just like skimming the yeah, tops of... eagles know how to fly. That's true. <laughs> like, if you put a GoPro on me, I'd be like, burp, burp, <laughs> into a building. That's true. Yeah. So what type of research, if any, did you do in order to be able to, you know, write accurately? Did you get to, like, reside in a mansion for a while, Marie? <laughs> Private jet? <laughs> Your own Alfred? That would, in Utopia, that's what I would have done. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I remember one night where uh, my husband and I just sat down. We're like, we are going to watch all of the Batman things. <laughs> and we got through quite a bit. <laughs> There's a lot out there. <laughs> Many alternate universes. I was very confused by the end, but, um, but that was fun. And I have some very good friends who know much more about Batman than I do. Um, and it was really fun to be able to talk to them over many hours of afternoon tea and you know the occasional late night frantic text message <laughs> about things. Um, uh, and you know I didn't grow up with comic books, but I've recently started reading more graphic novels. Um, and it's been really, really insightful to get into like the the origins of you know Batman in the comic books and in the graphic novels. And so, so yeah, that's been it's been nice to get to know Batman as I'm writing Batman. 
Yeah, I think there were two prongs to my research. Um, I Part of the reason I think I got the gig was because I wrote an essay about Wonder Woman for a book called Last Night a Superhero Saved My Life. And in the process of doing that, I was writing a lot about Wonder Woman's costume and her cultural impact. And so I'd done kind of a deep dive, like maybe deeper than I had to go, on um, on Marston and his life and um, the different inter iterations of Wonder Woman and um, the different ways she's been presented. So that was sort of, I was sort of ready to jump in when, um, when Random House in DC came calling. But the other part was, um, I really wanted to work like ancient Greek religious beliefs and ancient Greek mythology into the book uh, in a in a realistic way, and so I have a friend who's actually a doctor of ancient religions, and so um, you know the ideas of miasma and a Thanatos and Thanatos and sort of actual real the real premises of um, Greek. Uh, worship are worked into the fabric of Themyscira. And the goddesses to me were a really big um, and important part of, of this island and of, um, I wanted them to play a role. And also the battlefield gods who are absolutely terrifying, um, like the Erinye and, the, and Eris. And I mean, they're, when you really get into some of these minor gods, they get really specific and brutal. Like, well, who are these ladies? Well, they eat the flesh off of the dead. And who's this guy? Well, he's called algae full of weeping, you know, so, um, but it's great. Like as a writer, it's this incredible resource. So for me, that was really great. And then I spent, I couldn't exactly go to Greece. So I spent a lot of time on Google Earth. <laughs> and I literally made myself carsick, like traveling down this one road for like 30 <laughs> miles being like, click, click. But you know, bless the internet. I like that idea of like getting to know the, the superhero. And I feel like I got to know Superman in, in the research stage. You may not know this, but you could probably imagine that this, this would be true. We had to do pretty heavy synopsises. And I don't know how it is for you guys, but I'd never done that before in my life. My outlines are like a page long. And it Same. was like, I think I spent three months on the synopsis, which was crazy. Um, but I read a ton of Superman um, Bibles, you know, things like that. And then I, I remember the f most fascinating day. I spent like six hours on message boards complaining about Superman movies. And, uh, you know, like everybody's like, oh, of course, kryptonite comes into it. And I was like, wow, I don't want to piss everybody off. So I got to avoid these things. And then, you know, you, you can't. Is it, a, is it legal to quote Charles Barkley at Comic-Con? Yes. Is it really? Okay. So he has a great line where he goes, if everybody likes you, you're lying to somebody. And I think that's what you have to ultimately come down, where you have to come down when you're writing a superhero. You're entering this conversation, but you're not going to please every mm -hmm. fan. And also, it's really interesting to look at superheroes in terms of the time where they were when they were written, mm -hmm. the iteration. So cultural... Um, cultural things that are happening are so embedded in these storylines. I think that's very fascinating. Yep. All right, so for those of you who have questions, if you can please go to the microphones and then our lovely assistants will meet you with t-shirts and we've got about 15 minutes for questions and answers. Keep your questions Twitter size. Hi. <laughs> yeah. um, so I am a high school librarian, and I want to know, what is the rewarding thing that keeps you guys writing in the YA category? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like the books that, I mean, at least the books that I read when I was a young adult are the formative books, right? Like, there's no other books that can enter that special protected place in my heart. Um, they shape who I become as a, as a grown person. And so it's an incredible honor for me to write for that age, um, for people who are finding themselves and trying to understand themselves um, and figuring themselves out in the world. Um, I, it's a very special and hard and intimidating time. Um, and I, I enjoy writing to that uh, and remembering what it was like to be at that age and remembering that my audience um, who read those books can remember that time or are living it at that moment. And then I'll just add that for me, there's no like more powerful feedback than when a kid says, I've never seen myself in a book before until I read your book. And so it just makes you want to keep in that space. Thank you.
you. Um, what is the favorite thing that you found about writing your character when you're writing the superhero books, and what is your least favorite thing? Mm. Uh, I think the least favorite sounds fun. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, the least favorite was having to have anybody tell me what to do. <laughs> I guess yeah. I said that. Like, I don't like compromising. I'm not good at that. But um, I mean, my favorite thing, I mean, I think writing the Amazons was a, just a huge joy. And also, like, writing Diana's first trip to New York, like, it's set in our modern world. And, like, getting to just have her, like, smack down a few, like, investment banker bros on the subway was actually a great joy. Like, I don't know. It's... It's been fruitful of a lot of favorite things, honestly. Least favorite, plot. Because you know what? It's just so fun to just watch them use their powers. Like, yeah. that's the best part just of writing these, you know? It's like all these things you wish you could do, and then you're like, oh, I have to get back to plot. So, you know, kind of sticking with plot was hard for me. Um, I think my, my favorite thing was getting to create my own villain in the yeah. Batman world, because I feel like, like, what's Batman without the villains, right? So, Best um, so that was fun. Yeah. It was very, very fun making up a new, a new person for him to, to fight. Least favorite, not getting in to include my, my baby Nightwing. <laughs> <laughs> Tiny baby Nightwing waiting out there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hello there. Hi. Uh, so uh, qu first time questioner, I might stumble a little bit. But if you had a chance to write for another DC character or villain, who would you like to write about? Well, mine is Nightwing, so. <laughs> um, Especially since if you get to do Nightwing, you get to play with Raven and Starfire. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 <laughs> I don't know that I would choose Black Canary to write. Um, I don't know. Maybe the Joker? Okay. Or maybe the Joker I, I feel like good. Harley's dangerous territory for a YA novel, but interesting territory. Um, oh man, I don't know. I keep going to the villains yeah. as opposed to the heroes. I'm loyal to Superman. Superman. I'm loyal That's to it. Superman. Let's see. <laughs> Understood. Thank you. Um, this is kind of piggybacking off of Mary Elizabeth's research question, but with so you guys are all such amazing world builders, and with so many storylines and pre-existing like backgrounds for each of these characters, like where did you even begin or decide to like pinpoint where you were gonna put a teenage superhero? I mean, I think you see, like every, Matt made a great point, which is you're not gonna please everybody. So on some level, this is a personal journey, right? Mm -hmm. You go into the existing canon and you find the things that resonate with you and the things that don't. And I tend to believe there are certain things from story that, you know, it's almost like it rings a bell that, that generates a, a sound that comes off of the page and means something larger than the story that was written. And in some ways, I think Marston did not understand the bell he was ringing when he created Wonder Woman. So for me, in thinking about canon and thinking about her story, that's what I was looking for, is those moments of resonance. I think what was interesting is finding the voice of the character as a teen. So not even a geographic location, you know, like a, a setting in that term, but just finding their voice in that age was, was fascinating. How, they, how do they talk? How does Superman talk to girls? That's interesting, you know? Yeah. Cool, thank you. Hey, um, if you can mention it, what's your favorite character that you wrote about that wasn't the superhero? Favorite character we've written about that wasn't a superhero? Yeah, in the books. In the books. Yeah. In, in, in our DC books? Yeah. Mm. I mean, Alia is the girl that, I mean, I, I wanted Diana to leave the island because she met, because she met a girl. That sounds wrong, but you know what I mean. Um, but it, it doesn't sound wrong. Anyway, um, I, I wanted her friendship with a mortal girl to be the thing that guided her into the world of men. And um, Alia is not an ordinary girl. She's a war bringer. She's a descendant um, of Helen of Troy and a whole line of girls who bring about an age of destruction, because that's what we do. And, um, and so I loved writing Alia. I loved writing her. And I loved writing her crew, though, too. Like that, my favorite thing is found families. So generating this group of friends for her um, was, and for Diana to learn, she's never been around teenagers before. Mm -hmm. She's never gotten to do that. And so getting her to have like a squad was really fun. Thank you. 
<laughs> okay, so my child just stole my question. <laughs> I have read, read Warbringer, so I have another question. I don't know if you can answer this, but the side characters are so compelling in that book. Are we ever going to hear anything more from them? I don't know if you from can. From whom? From the side characters in Warbringer. Um, or in any of the books. I, I mean, don't is there a plan? plan to write a sequel, okay. but uh, you never know. Never say never. I mean, I would, I would love to see some of those characters yeah. have life beyond the book. I would love that too. And I'm Thank looking you. forward to the other books as well. Um, in diving in more into these characters than you may have before, is there anything about the characters that you found like yourself in or you most identify with in, with the characters? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. You know what was f very interesting with the Superman thing is the discovery of who he really is and where he comes from and how he arrived to the Kent farm. Um, that was fascinating and I don't know, like it kind of echoes what you learn as a teenager, like who you really are, what, what you can do well, um, and owning that. But the confusion of, of figuring out who you really are is, is very interesting. For me, you know, I'm a mixed race person, so that's always been something I've been trying to figure out for my whole life. And in a weird way, that echoed that, that experience of like finding out who Clark was. Yeah, the, the confusion thing was a huge part of discovering Bruce as well for me. Um, just tr like, I don't have a lot in common with Bruce, but um, that feeling of being, um, navigating the dangerous waters of growing up and also making mistakes and being wrong about things. Mm. Um, and th him thinking that something is so right that he must absolutely be right about something and then realizing that he's not. Um, I identified with that a lot uh, when I was writing it. I think for Diane, I mean, I couldn't be more different from Diana physically. I have a disability and like I'm never gonna be somebody who can, who can, I mean, even when I didn't have a disability, I couldn't really run more than a few miles. But I, I think she doesn't stop. She doesn't stop. What defines her is not that she can do these things, is that she will not stop until she does, until she, if she sees wrong being done or if she sees the weak being hurt, she will not stop. And I think that that relentlessness is something we all kind of have inside of us if we can tap into it. Thank you. So uh, DC right now has kind of a reputation for being really grim, dark, and unsaturated. And I was wondering how that played into your writing process. Like, did you lean into it? Did you push back against it? Did you, you know, I revel in it? put a sepia tone filter over my <laughs> laptop when I write. Nice. Little panda ears, panda ear filter. <laughs> Tongue dog. I, I um, mean, we all write to darkness on some level. But mm -hmm. for me, what was, I mean, Diana has a great deal of sincerity. And there was no reason to step away from that. You know, good is not boring. Kindness is not boring. Compassion is not boring. We've been taught to think that those that, you know, only anti-heroes and, uh, and people who are willing to blur the line and walk the edge or whatever they're doing, that those are the people who are the most interesting. But sometimes the people who are trying to do the right thing and are stumbling or who are making the wrong choices in the quest to do the right thing are just as interesting. And those That's are the people who steer the people who are in the blurred lines mm. to do the right thing. Um, and makes them interesting. And also when it when the, the momentum is moving toward darkness, it's kind of awesome to not do that. You know, like to go against the grain. Writers are all contrarians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Was there any change that you wanted to make to the characters that DC just said no? <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that you can share. <laughs> Matt, Marie? <laughs> you know, I'm still, I mean, well, first of all, um, I did have a major one at the beginning, but, but I'm still finishing up. They're done. Their stuff is like, they're like drinking wine and having fun. <laughs> I'm still like, I got to go work on the rest of it right after this panel. So I, I have a feeling there's something I put in there that is going to get rejected. Damn it. There's always more that we want to put in than we are able to, but um, in the end, you, you do the best with what you can. Hi. Hi. So um, it sounds like this whole process was pretty unique for you guys. So I'm wondering what was like the one thing that either surprised you the most or that you enjoyed the most about tackling a project in a different direction than you're used to. 
in terms of working collaboratively yeah, with Yeah, in terms the of working with characters that already like existed and had a world. Playing in someone else's sandbox. Yeah. I, I mean, I, it was a lot more fun than I expected it to be in some ways. Like, I remember, like I, I was on these dual deadlines. It was like a very intense year of writing Crooked Kingdom, and as soon as I would turn that draft in, I would get to Wonder Woman. And I thought that was, and I think if I hadn't been writing her and I hadn't been writing this particular book, it would have been a much worse year. Like I remember sitting down to write, the book opens with a line that says, you do not enter a race to lose. And I remember that line just sort of arriving and sitting down and um, just gusting through the first part of this novel because it was a joy to be in her head and, um, and to be in this world that like, yes, it belongs to so many other people, but because of that, it's kind of like, it's like people are giving you answers, like at any side, you're like, oh, like at one point, but like, you get these weird ideas, like initially I was like, maybe she could have a pet leopard on the <laughs> island who she does, and then you're like, no. But like, there are, there are con you're in constant dialogue with these things that came before, and that's daunting, but it's also sort of exciting. Yeah, and it kind of like changed the way that I structure how I begin my drafts as well, because this was the first time that I had to outline something. I was forced to outline um, you people, before. And, you and were I'm not outlining. I just, I can't, I want to. This is not a thing <laughs> that is not a choice that I'm conscious decision that I'm making. Um, and I've never been able to, to be an outliner in my own books, uh, but because of this book, I was forced to outline a story out and it made the process much smoother and faster than I usually get to work with. So. Um, and the fact that you have a team behind you is, like Lee said, comforting to be able to like ask a question and you like there's other people inside of this universe that know things that I don't, um, which is never the case when I'm writing my own stuff. So um, so after this book, I uh, have been approaching the writing of my own books in a different way, and I'm able to outline better than I used to. So thank you, Batman. By the way, outlining is one thing, but we have to do like 25 pages single spaced outline. You know what I mean? Synopsis. Do you do Ooh. that with your regular books? I write zero drafts, which are essentially like oh, these, see. and then if I have to do a synopsis, I polish up the synopsis so that it, you know, like, I see. yeah. But I will also say, like, you discover weird questions that you that never occurred to me before, that but obviously are occurring. Like, I, I there was a long discussion about how vulnerable Amazons were to bullets, you mm -hmm. know, because there's different versions of that, and and my version is very different from the movie, in part because there had to be a level of vulnerability with her going into the mortal world, but like. I don't know, I really enjoy those discussions, you know? It's sort of like, like these sort of things that come up that don't ordinarily come up in comics. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. So just a quick note that we have received our five minute warning, so we may not make it through all of the questionnaires in line, but our authors will be going to the autograph area under the sales, and you can also ask them questions there and get books signed. Although the only one that will be available is the review copies of Warbringer. Well, you can buy all of our books, but um, we will also are giving away um, arcs of Warbringer. Yes, yeah. their, their other works are yes. there, yes. just not the DC ones. Who can't buy her books? <laughs> well, thank God for that, because I've been, my whole town has no rise and ruin. I've been oh. looking everywhere for it. <laughs> um, anyways, okay, so if you woke up and you find yourself in a universe that you created that's not DC, what universe would that be, and what would you do to help either the pr protagonist or antagonist? So if we woke up in one of our worlds, what would we do? <laughs> how oh would you, God. in our yeah. worlds that we've created? In a world that you created, how would you help out either the good guy or the bad guy? What would you do? Oh, my uh, God. What's, what's, what power? I would be a terrible hindrance to my characters. <laughs> 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 they would be constantly like, like, where did she go? She's lost again. We have to go find her in the subways. <laughs> Um, I don't think they would want me around. <laughs> um, I would like to be in their worlds, though. Um, I, I have a book coming out this also this fall um, called Warcross, which is set in um, basically our modern times, but in a in a world that's been basically gamified. Um, and I think that would be fun. But I'm again, I don't think my main character would. She's, she's like, you stay here in the hotel. I will go do the thing, uh, and then I'll call you if I need something. <laughs> You're the man in the chair. I would just watch. I wouldn't even try to alter the outcome. I would just watch and study it. I just think things are fascinating. I would go to parties. I would not be helpful. I would be like, take me to the best party. I would wear great clothes. I'd eat great food. And I'd inevitably die quickly because my worlds are full of horrors. So, yeah. <laughs> so we're all useless. I, think, is, is yeah, I know, yeah, exactly. 
If you could create your own superhero or supervillain, what would they be? Mm. Comic Con, it, it involves very difficult questions. I'm learning. <laughs> Sorry, I was assigned this question. Uh, oh, you were. Um, a there's child. a goddess who appears in uh, in Warbringer, Nemesis, the goddess of divine retribution. She was also known as the Inescapable. So I would like to write around her. Yeah. She doesn't mess around. And she's got wings. Always fun. Yeah. Power of flight. Power of flight. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> yeah, see? You're actually good and you don't know that. No. Um, well, I got to create my supervillain in um, Nightbring uh, Nightbringer. Nightbringer. <laughs> Nightwalker. <laughs> Batman Nightwalker. Uh, so, so that was fun. She's basically like a teen girl Hannibal Lecter, um, which is fun. But she doesn't eat people. Um, that's the one difference. <laughs> She's a vegetarian. She's a vegetarian. <laughs> Team girl, Hannibal Lecter. Okay. Matt, you just got anything? I'm just trying to speed it around. Oh. Speed it along. Okay. All right. So, and this is going to be our last question. But you Yay. should try to get shirts. <laughs> so I have more of a writing question. Um, and that is, after you've finished your first draft and you've done all your creating and your world building and you're feeling good about it and then... Maybe you've done some revision. How do you know in your maybe a heavier second, third draft that you're actually making it better? And were there any, um, any parts of these stories that you had to just absolutely change um, after your first draft? Yeah, my, my first drafts are incredibly rough. Um, and I don't really know that it's clicking. By the way, you look fantastic. I know, I you do. Your outfit. I, I wanted to take a picture. Um, I love it so much. And... Um, it's not until I get to towards the end that I really start liking it. And sometimes I don't really like my book until it's already out on the shelves, you know? So I never really know um, when it starts working, but it, usually it's some hint of when the characters start to come to life on their own and have conversations with each other. Um, and I find that I'm able to have more ease writing those chapters where they're interacting with each other and, um, and exploring those emotions that that it starts clicking, but usually my first drafts are basically like point A to point B, they need to get into the car, they need to get to the thing, they need to do this, um, so. Yeah, and I think for me, um, you know, my first drafts, I don't even know what the book is about until I finish. That's why out, like, a, like a, a detailed outline is hard for me, because I don't really know what it means, any of it means yet, and then when I finish, I'm like, oh, I get it now, thematically what I'm doing. But for me, my favorite part is when the dialogue starts popping. And that, and that happens deeper into the process. I feel like when you write a book, you have two jobs. Get the story right, but also get the music right. And like dialogue fits into that for me. And to have a moment of synchronicity in your question about how do you know when to stop on your draft, we have reached when to stop on our panel. So thank you all so much for joining us.